Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm with WealthSoup.com where we talk about how to get control of your finances, get out of debt, and build your personal wealth. Today, I'm excited to have Simone Millicis. She's the author of Joy of Business. And for the last 14 years, Simone has worked as a coordinator for Access Consciousness, which is a multi-million dollar company operating in over 130 countries. Simone woke up one day and realized, like a lot of people, she was in debt, $187,000 in personal debt. Now, after changing her relationship with money and with herself, Simone had cleared herself of debt and learned how to really prosper. And Simone has some incredible insights to offer on why people get themselves into debt and what they can do to get out of it. Simone, I'm really excited to talk. Thanks for joining me. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for having me on here. Um, first of all, how'd you get into $187,000 of debt? What, ha- what happened? <laughs> you know, I don't, I this don't, is, you know, know this surprised me. Every time I read these stats on people getting into debt, it's so common. But, yeah, I know. Look, and I think that's the, the key there too, is because it's the, the unawareness and the ignorance. Like, I don't know, Jeremy, I've always been, you know, pretty good at, at, at talking and stuff and I've been pretty good at getting money, whether it's like loans, jobs, because I still got a lot of money even when I was in debt. I just kept creating more debt. Yeah. So I kept, like I would get a loan from, I mean, this random place, Lithuanian Club, where my dad was a member of, you know, that it's really hard to get a loan from and I got a loan from them and I had a loan from a bank and so I just had all of these and I was very good at getting credit cards and, you know, talking my way into things, I guess. So I didn't realize what I was creating. Somewhere I think I knew what was occurring, but until I sat down one day and just went, okay, Simone, you have to get clear on this. Just how much money do you owe and to who, you know? Yeah. You don't want to look at the reality because it's scary. No. no. And most people don't want to look at the reality because it's scary. It's like most people don't want to have a look at the financial yeah. stuff. I mean, it's, you know, it's Christmas time you know, at the moment and money comes up for everybody. Everybody always has this point of view about money that they start to stress out that they can't afford things. But it's interesting because it's like whose point of view is that? It's like you're buying into other people's points of view. So where, when you looked closely at the debt, where was it? Where did, what did you spend it on? (laughs) Well, you know, it was like uh, many different things. Like I even like, you know, my friends would be like, I mean, I live in Queensland and my friends at the time I lived in Sydney and they'd be like, hey, you want to go from, to Melbourne for the weekend? Like there's this band playing and let's go, you know, there's great restaurants down there. Or let's go shopping. And I'd always be like, sure. Like you never, the thing was, Jeremy, you never knew I was in debt. The way I lived my life, you never knew that. So I didn't stop shopping. I didn't stop, uh, you know. I don't know, getting a nicer car, didn't stop getting, you know, booking my flights. I wasn't living in this scarcity. I wasn't living in lack. Mm-hmm. I still lived like I had money. So the funny thing was, Jeremy, I pretty much had nothing to show for it. Like I was investing some money in a business that I had at the time, uh, but I still just, I lived, you know, I had that uh, living champagne lifestyle and a beer budget. Mm-hmm. I definitely did that, yeah. <laughs> so at what point, what made you awake and actually look closely at things? Okay, so I remember distinctly, it was um, at an Access Consciousness event. It was I was actually organizing these events for Gary Douglas and Dan here. And it was the third class I'd gone to that was a money class. And they're talking about these tools on money and how to change your life around money and, you know, this sort of thing. And I'm sitting there, you know, and I'm hearing, you know, like the dog hearing blah, 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 yep, yep, yep. You, you just know. hear, let's get another credit card. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was like, yeah, yeah, this is good for everybody else, but I'm so in debt that I can't get out of it, you know, and yeah. oh, but I'll sit here and listen sort of thing. And it was the third class and I sat there and thought, hmm, what if I actually used some of these tools and what if I did something about it? Now, the funny thing was, Jeremy, years ago I was a smoker and I remember when I gave up smoking and I told everybody, I was like, I'm giving up smoking, you know, because I thought that my friends and family would be really uh, you know, inspired and enthused and sort of going, oh, good on you, Simone, you can do it. And what I noticed was nobody did that. Everybody was like, sure, you know, you're not going to be able to do that. You sure I don't want a cigarette? And like they'd try and entice you or something. And I didn't give up smoking at that stage. And when I did give up smoking, I thought I have to go cold turkey and not tell anyone. 
So I did that and for about three weeks, people didn't even notice that I had given up smoking and then I thought, okay, I have to do the same thing with the money stuff, not say to people, I'm changing my money situation because I noticed that so many people have a judgment, usually of themselves, um, but based on what you're choosing. So I Mm -hmm. didn't tell anyone. I was like, okay, I'm going to start to put some of these money tools into action and see what happens. So I wasn't like being judged or there's no projections, you know, from anyone. It was like, okay, let's start to do this and, and mm-hmm. see what shows up. Yeah. So before we go into some of the steps you use to climb out of it, you know, some people have a painful moment that makes them change. Because at that point, it seems almost happy. Like you're spending money, you're, you're yeah. you know, <laughs> going on trips, you're going out to eat, you're shopping. What's the pain that made you even want to change? Even if you're in a seminar... I could see yeah. like, okay, that like you said, that's for other people but but not for me. What what yeah. actually made you in that moment want to change? Okay, so I guess uh, it's not like a specific moment. It's it's more like that energy of feeling stuck. Mm-hmm. Um, it's sort of like if you have, like at the moment in my life, it's like I, I've created a great life. I have a lot of fun. I have money now, you know, and I travel the world and do all of that and there's a sort of this sense of freedom, like a sense of peace I have. Mm-hmm. And I guess what ended up happening was sort of like the walls came came in. You know, it's like more and more people were sort of ringing me or, you know, I wouldn't want to answer my phone because I owed, you know, some supplier $35,000 and I was like, uh, you know. So the walls started mm-hmm. closing in on me. And mm-hmm. that's the moment where I sort of went, okay, Simone, you actually have to start looking at how much money you owe and see what you can do about it. Yeah. That's a scary thing. Yeah, it is. It is. Because you also, when you, when I, and also, um, Jeremy, when I worked out, I was $187,000 in debt. I was like, oh my goodness, how, you know, how am I ever going to get out of debt with this much? And that's the thing I see people do too. They sort of go, oh, this is too much. Oh, quick, I'll, you know, put it back underneath the table or, or underneath the carpet and, and ignore it again. So, you know, I have some tools for that too to have a look at that because yeah. no amount of debt is too much debt is mm-hmm. what I would say. Yeah, and we'll have you talk about that. And I know I mentioned it was your relationship with money early on and your relationship with yourself. So what's the contrast? What was your relationship with money and with yourself early on? Well, I grew up in a family that was, you know, you know, dinner on the table, meat and three veg, glass of milk sort of thing. And you spoke about... I don't know, the neighbors, you spoke about the sports carnival. You didn't talk about money or business, which was interesting for me because I always had an interest of business and sort of as I grew older, I would start to talk about that and I would, uh, my mother would always sort of shut it down and be like, you know, don't talk about money or business at the dinner table. So it wasn't really talked about, but I did go to a private school in Sydney, Australia. It's like, so I was surrounded by people who had money. Mm -hmm. It's like we were, I would say, you know, above middle class. Um, so there was not a problem around money. I do remember as a kid, this I've got this funny story that there was, um, I was, I don't know, probably like four or five. My brother would have been about seven. And we were downstairs and we could hear mum and dad fighting and they were fighting over money and saying that they didn't have any money and, you know, mm. this sort of thing. So my brother and I are downstairs thinking, we'll solve the family money problem, you know. <laughs> and we go into our bedrooms and we grab all our favorite toys and we brought them upstairs to our mum and dad and said, hey, you know, we know we don't have any money, so we'll sell our toys and then mm-hmm. we can have some money. I know. And can you imagine like my parents at that stage, I'm I'm sure that at that moment they went, oh, this is ridiculous that we're fighting about money. And also the thing that I didn't get at that age was they were fighting about sort of cash. Like we had assets, but we didn't have cash. But I was a five-year-old kid. I didn't know the difference between assets and cash. Mm-hmm. So I think that sort of got them out of their, you know, their judgment That's a or their big view. pattern interrupt when your kids offer to sell their toys. Yo, I know. <laughs> Jeez. You sort of have to start to look at something, hey. So what did the early part of your career look like? What did you start to, when you um, you know, got a little bit older, what were you doing for work? Uh, do you know what? I, I've always been, like I've had a lot of people say to me that, you know, uh, I had one friend say to me that, that I made them sick of how much job satisfaction I got. I've always loved what I did. I never understood why you would work at something or do something if you didn't love it. It's like that doesn't make any sense to me. So, And I was willing to do anything, um, always still am. So I had all these ideas. I'm quite creative. So I had a lot of ideas and I would just sort of start to implement them. I worked in many different jobs. Like I traveled the world. So 
I mean, I remember working in the Greek islands as a kamaki, which means you have to stand outside this restaurant and, and say, you know, welcome to Captain, Ma Captain Angelo's. We have, you know, three specials tonight. You get a free glass of wine and I, you know, convince people to come and eat at the restaurant. So I did many, many different things. Uh, when I eventually started my own business, um, one of the first ones was a company called Good Vibes For You, which has done many different things. But I would always do anything I noticed to get money. Like at one stage in Sydney, there's the Gay Mardi Gras. Uh, it's huge, you know, and I wanted to go to all the parties and do all of that and I didn't have the money to do it at the stage. So my friend and I went, okay, what can we do? So we made up these tubs of glitter um, that, you know, put on your face and all over your body and stuff. And at that stage, glitter was huge. And we had these big baskets and we walked around Oxford Street in Sydney going, hugs for free, glitter for $5, hugs for free, glitter for $5, you know. And uh, we got a lot of hugs and we sold a lot of glitter. We made like $3,000 in, in one night just from wow. selling glitter. It was amazing. So and people were tipping us and everything. So, But I've always been willing to like not sort of sit back, even when I was in debt, not sort of sit back and say that nothing was possible. I've always created something else. Mm -hmm. But definitely lived the champagne lifestyle on the beer budget for many, many years. <laughs> so then what brings you to, what brought you to access consciousness? Um, I met Gary Douglas, the founder of Access, um, at a Mind, Body and Spirit Festival in Australia. Um, actually, it was a pretty full-on moment in my life because I... I was doing this stand and, you know, I had a, the business Good Vibes for You. We had stickers and T-shirts and things with sayings on it that I perceived would change, you know, the way you looked at life. But I just had a really good friend of mine go to Bali. She was surfing in Bali and got bitten by a mosquito and died within three days, oh which gosh. is pretty unusual. Yeah, I know. It's one of the rarest cases. And so I was totally upset. You know that movie, um, Four Weddings and a Funeral? I felt like that where I just mm -hmm. wanted everything to stop. It was so frustrating to me that everything was going on around me. I would paid thousands of dollars to do this stand, so I still had to go to Sydney and set it up and do all this stuff and I was, I was angry. I was really cranky. Uh, and I knew an access facilitator. I didn't really know what access was about at all. But he walked around the corner with the founder, Gary Douglas, and he walked around and you know introduced me to him and I hugged him. <laughs> well, he hugged me actually. and. I sort of hugged him and pulled away and he looked at me and he goes, you know what, you'd be a lot better off if you're open to receiving. And in my head I'm just thinking, you know what, you have no idea what's going on in my life right now. Like I'm so angry and so cranky that my friend has just died and, you know, so yeah, whatever, you know, crazy man sort of thing. Um, and that night I actually went out drinking and drunk too much <laughs> and had a bit of a hangover the next day I came in and I was just looking to find something that would relieve my hangover pain and I walked past the access stand and they had all these massage tables so and someone said to me would you like your bars run and all I saw was massage table you know and I was like Can I lie down on that <laughs> and they were like sure that's what happens you know so I laid down on the massage table and 10 minutes into it I'm you know and you've got it like I've got a big you know good vibes for you logo it's a rainbow logo and I'm like you know selling my business of so it's like hey life is good you know and I'm lying on this table bawling my eyes out like mm. just tears crying and crying and immediately I was like I've got to go I've got to go back to work you know and set up because I didn't know what was going on why were you and, crying at that point well now I know it's about receiving it's like this woman was being, oh, because I also stood up and I went to pay her and she goes, no, no, it's a gift. I know you're friends with this guy. And I just burst out crying even more. And Gary walked around the corner and he said to me, do I have to give you another hug? And I was like, no. And he's like, and I was like, yes, no, I don't know. And he took me outside. He said, look, if you want to go outside and chat. And I, you know, I remember he just asked me questions. And he got me to have a look at like my life and the friends or the so-called friends that I had in my life that to this day I, I get we're not really that great of friends um, and start to have a look at the judgments that I was creating about myself and to sort of change that and get rid of that. Uh, he was so kind um, and just had this sense of peace about him that I remember we stood up and he looked at me and he said, Where, which way are you going because there was these uh, different doors to go in and I looked at him and I was I went I'm going with you <laughs> so I was like there was something about that energy that I was like what is this stuff like mm -hmm. I want to know more about this 
uh, it was pretty much like everything I knew I was looking for, you know, and I looked for it in drugs and trying to be different in everything in my life. And then when I met Gary and the tools of access, I was like, oh, my goodness, this is everything I'd like to create in the world, except he had these tools that worked a hell of a lot quicker than me just trying to get it out there on a sticker, you know, <laughs> or a T-shirt. So, but it's definitely about receiving, Jeremy. I've had, that's been one of the big things of my life, I would say. Uh, I always thought that, you know, I was here to give. Like, I'd have all these conversations growing up and, you know, what are you supposed to be on the planet for? And it was, you know, I'm here to give, I'm here to do this, help, 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 give, all that sort of stuff. And when I met Gary, I realized that it was actually okay to receive. And that's a very, yeah, very different point of view. It's a big distinction, yeah. Yeah, and it, you know what, Jeremy, that comes in with money. I mean, how many of us are unwilling to receive money? Mm -hmm. We say it's about our creations. We say that we can do it on our own, that we don't need help or all of these justifications yeah. that we have. And yet, what if you were willing to receive money? It's like, it could look really different. Yeah, it's hard because you're trained a certain way or you've trained yourself a certain way. How do you take the steps to be a better receiver? You know what, my um, suggestion <laughs> is the next time someone says, hey, can I buy you a drink? Can I get that coffee for you? Can I buy you lunch? Instead of you going, no, no, I've got it, or let me get it. Like, and it's, it's interesting because the amount of times that you don't want to receive it and just mm -hmm. go, oh, yeah, that would be great, thanks, and receive it. Because if you start to receive those smaller things, mm -hmm. then you can start to receive something else. And you know what it feels like when someone, like when you want to buy someone lunch, and they go, oh, great, thanks. It feels really nice. It feels I mean, better, yeah. it's just it's around the corner. You know, I love gifting presents and seeing their faces light up when they ha they get something too that they, they I know that they want, you know. And there's such an energy of that. Like my dad, for years and years and years, he died like three years ago. Mm, and sorry to hear that. He was an amazing man. Yeah, he, he was in his early 90s. He did well. <laughs> he was great. Um but he was amazing and he was definitely one of my greatest mentors in life. And for a long time, I would say, I don't need your money. I can do this on my own. Like, I don't need anything from you. And after I started to, when I made that choice of going, okay, what would it take if I use these access tools and see if I can actually change my money situation? One of the things was I realized that um, my dad had said to me years ago that he would never leave this planet. He would never die until he knew his kids were financially stable. And I realized that I was creating myself to be this financial mess. Like, this is an insane point of view. Um, oh, in that's order an interesting point, up. yeah. You know? I mean, but that's the thing. It's the insane points mm. of view that lives up. So subconsciously, so I, you, you think that because of that, you uh, were creating the situation. Yeah, totally. If I, if I, because my... Sisters were doing fine. My brother was doing fine. So if I create myself as a financial mess, then my dad will never leave me. Hmm. <laughs> it's like, you know, I mean, but we create these points of view. So it's like you have to be willing to, to change that. And when I spoke to him, one of the things that he did was he gave me $50,000. So that was part of getting out of the debt. But you know what, Jeremy, when he gave it to me and I received it, I watched his whole body just sort of go, oh. And there was this ease and I was like, wow. And I realized what a mean daughter I'd been for over 20 years by not being willing to receive from him. Like it was such a gift fit to him. So that gave me more awareness too on, on what it can be for mm -hmm. the other person and for yourself by receiving. Mm -hmm. It's like so, that was an easy 50 grand. <laughs> so Simone, what were the steps that you were able to climb out of this? Because it's a huge pile of debt. Yeah. Okay. So I would say the first thing that changed it for me is, um, well, changing your point of view around money for sure. Like, and like I said before, it's like you've got to know that it doesn't matter how in debt you are. It's like if you're ten thousand dollars, a thousand dollars, or five hundred thousand, you can change it. So the first thing I did was putting ten percent of every single thing I earn away. So every dollar I earn, put ten cents away, and I still do it. Now, and you don't spend it. Okay, so I have it in a bank account. It's like after everyone has a certain amount of money that they get to, that once they reach that amount of money, there seems to be like this, you know, sense of peace and ease in your world. For me, it was about thirty thousand dollars. When I got to thirty thousand in my ten percent account, 
I started to feel like I could create more, like I wasn't just creating based on I have no money. Um, and then, then I started to do things like buy gold and buy silver and I have that in my safe like that I you know, would enjoy. Now, people will hear this tool, they're putting 10% away for you and it's an honoring of you and most people like put off doing it, they won't do it or they say I've got all these bills to pay, how can I put 10% away? The thing I would strongly suggest is that if you don't do it, then you, you won't, you'll be honoring your bills and not you. Okay, so even for three months, if for three months you put away 10% of everything you earn and put it away and see if there's an energy that starts to change with your money situation, with your financial awareness um, and don't spend it. Don't spend it for a rainy day, not even when you go, oh yeah, I want to go on that holiday though. No, it's an honoring of you. It's not logical but you'll start to make more money. So mm -hmm. see if it starts to change. And Now I started doing this and I literally rang my suppliers and was like, hey, I'm aware that I owe you $35,000, I'm really sorry, I don't have it at the moment and I became very sort of truthful I guess with everyone I owed money to and I said, look, I'm going to do everything I can to get this money to you, I don't have it at the moment and I started putting away my 10% and this supplier said to me, Simone, can my wife and I take you out to dinner and I was like, seriously, <laughs> $35,000 and you want to take me out to dinner? And they're like, hey, look, we've thoroughly enjoyed doing business with you. We think you're great. We love what you do. You know, we know you'll pay. And I did end up paying them. I paid everything off, you know. What were they uh, providing you? What was the... Oh, were they, they, were, they were the suppliers of all my stickers. Stickers, magnets, like all the, the graphical. So if I didn't have them, if they weren't willing to supply me, I wouldn't have had my business at that stage. So I pretty much relied on them. So ignoring them, I realized wasn't going to work either. I had to sort of sit down and go, okay, guys. I get that I owe you this amount of money and sort of work out a payment plan. So that's the other thing that I would say is get um, – and every time I've done this, it's – I mean I just said to my partner the other day, we need to do this again because every time we do, we make more money, is work out how much your monthly expenses are. Now my suggestion is, is ask your accountant or your bookkeeper for a profit and loss of 12 months because you tend not to think about – you go, oh, my car is like $50 a month in petrol or something. But no, you've got the service and the registration. So if you look at it and then go car maintenance, divide it by 12, so it's 220 sort of thing. And you get to see how much you are spending on everything per month. Do it for everything, utilities. Add 20% just for the fun of it. Add your 10% and then ask for that amount of money to show up. Also add if you're in debt. So say you've got you know $10,000 in debt. Divide it by 12. How much would you have to pay off each month? to get you out of that debt and if you can't do it in 12 months then do it by 24 or 36 or whatever works out that makes you have this sense that you can actually achieve that and it's a possibility you know and then have a look at that amount now the first time I did this it was eight thousand dollars a month and I looked at it and I was like how am I ever going to make eight thousand dollars a month but this was like you know I like to get a massage once a month it's like I like to go out to dinner like you know write it this is your life, like, you know, this is not a, a you know, a, a practice session, so it's like, this is your life, what would you like your life to look like? So write that out, And but I went, okay, I'm going to demand that I make $8,000 or more a month, and within about three or four months, I started to make more than $8,000 a month, and every single time I've done this, I look at it and go, seriously, <laughs> that much a month? And I end up making more than that. So, so how do you it, demand? You said you demand to make it. What does that look like? Um, okay, so demand, I would say, for me, is like an energy. It's um, it's sort of like this energy of like, you know what, no matter what it takes, no matter what it looks like, I'm, I'm doing this. Like, you know, I see people who want to create a business or make more money, but then they're not really willing to get off their butt and do anything. It's like, you've got to do something. There's some action required to make something happen. So, you know, I've had, you know, years of my life where I worked three or four jobs because I wanted more, I wanted to make more money or I wanted to travel overseas or whatever I wish to do. So it's like making that demand, it's like, okay, so what action would I have to take now to actually have this occur? What extra business would I have to do? Mm -hmm. It's like what other revenue stream can I ask for to show up? Mm -hmm. That's the questions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so how did you get allowed to show up? At that point, you said then you started making more than what you asked for. Yeah, I did. I started making more. Well, I mean, with Access Consciousness, it's like at the point when I did, I was, I was an Access Consciousness facilitator. So I thought, 
okay, I moved into this new apartment, which I didn't think I could afford, but I wanted to move there. And one of the things I did was I was like, okay, what if I have these clearing nights? So we have these clarity nights. They're like, you know, an hour and a half, two hours. It's $35 to come along, um, you know, and see what happens. And it's like I had like uh, I think there was 30 or 40 people showed up to my first one. And I was like, wow, that was easy. So it's like, you know, and then that starts to sort of, you know, what else could I add to that? And I was like, oh, we have all the access books. I could sell the books at these events as well you know, and then add to that. And it's like, as well as, you know, my, my business that I had, as well as what classes could I facilitate? So it's sort of like not going, okay, I've got one thing. This is what I do. I mean, I often say to people, how many documents do you have open on your computer at once? Like, do you have one <laughs> program or do you have many? Like how many sticky notes do you have? 27. You I had 27 last night. Right. <laughs> so what if you had 27 revenue streams? Yeah. Like what if each one of those represented a revenue stream? Like so many people, including myself, thought, okay, I can only really have one business and do that one business well. It's not true. And it's like there's so many different things that you can add to your life. So one of the questions I would ask too, you know, is who or what else can I add to my business? Mm -hmm. Who or what else can I add to my yeah. life? It's powerful. You don't have to do everything yourself yeah. either. It's the thing that people get stuck on. Yeah, the questions we ask ourselves are the answers we will get for sure. So what's mm -hmm. the next thing, what's the next step that you use to get out of the debt? Uh, okay, so the 10% away and then working out my finances. The third thing that I used was there's a tool, access tool of like carrying a amount of money around with you that you perceive a wealthy person would carry. I don't have it on me, but I have because <laughs> I'm downstairs. Um, I carry a wallet around with me and it has in it, uh, about five different currencies up to, you know, a couple of thousand dollars in different currencies. And I also have a gold bullion coin because it's just fun to have. Um, so that's a one ounce coin. I want to see this and I thing. Carry, yeah. uh, you want, I know, <laughs> it's upstairs. <laughs> I should have brought it down. I'm sorry. Um, but I carry it around with me at all times. Now, I had no idea. This is an access tool, okay? So I hear these tools and I'm sitting at this event going, oh, gosh, you know, hearing these tools again. What if I just gave them a go? Like I had no idea what would happen. For me, that one I realized was um, there was a sense of no lack. Like, you know, my friends always have some water because I always have water on me, okay? I've got a glass of water here. I always have a bottle of water. I have I always have water. I swear to God, I think I died of thirst in a previous lifetime or something. So, you Water's know. Water's healthy. It's good. Yeah, it's good. But it's like I have to have it on me. I get, you know. So, but if I don't have water on me, I feel like I'm thirsty. If I have water on me, then I don't necessarily get thirsty. It's the same thing as money. If I have money on me, I don't feel like there's this lack. Mm -hmm. There's a sense of actually having money. So that's yeah. what it created for me. Interesting. Yeah. And it's, it's I mean. Aren't you, know you I mean? worried it's, though, like someone will rob you? You know I mean, what? It's maybe it's like, a dumb question, but I, I would think, no, it's, I no, see what not, you mean, like carrying a lot of money. That makes perfect sense, but I'd be thinking in the back of my mind, what if someone, I mean, I'm in Chicago, like if I'm walking in the city, like what if someone, I have thousands of dollars on, in me? Is that a rational thought? Yeah, I mean, people ask that question all the time and it's yeah. like, okay, so someone robs me, it's just money. That's number one. And number two, you become really aware of your money. Like I know where my purse is pretty much at all times. Like yes. I'm not going to walk out of a room and leave my purse there or, or at a restaurant. Yeah. You know, it's like at a restaurant. It I'd gives be you like, greater respect, you mean, you think? You do. Yeah, you have more awareness of it, more respect of it, more um, – like I said before with the – when you asked me about how I got into debt and it's like mm. I really do get that it was a lot of ignorance and a lot of um, unawareness around it like anti-consciousness rather than being conscious about it. And it's like when you have that money, you become aware of it and conscious of it. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, and if someone steals it, okay, not the worst thing that could occur. So I can just make more. Right, exactly. <laughs> I like that. Um, so what else? What else did you do? Uh, well, they would be the three main things Probably that I did. Like things. literally they changed yeah. it so much for me. Um, the 10% was huge for me. Um and it's, it is a courageous move to start mm. doing it. Like I know with your listeners, it's like and if you do owe money, you, the first thing I know that people yeah. go to is, oh, well, I'll, I'll start it, you know, in six months' time once I've paid these off. And it's like, no, you've got to yeah. start it now. Yeah, today. what do you tell people about that? If they go, you know, not only do I not have 10%, but I have, you know, each month I'm in the hole $1,000. How am I supposed to save 10%? You're telling them it doesn't matter what situation doesn't you're in. 
It doesn't matter because the world is not linear. Life is not linear, but we try and make it linear. Like, you know, we try and make this reality linear. It's not. It's like it doesn't work out like that. That's like saying my day is going to work out exactly as I plan it in the morning. No, it doesn't. It never does. So it's like same thing as money. It's like it's not linear. It's like what if it was so much more about energy? So it's the energy that you create. And that's why I say to people, do it for three months. Mm -hmm. See what happens. Mm -hmm. At the end of that three months, you know, have a glass of water, have a glass of wine, whatever shoot, you know, floats your boat and then be like, what if I did another three months? So it's like you're only committing to this small, you know, amount of time for yourself and see if something starts to change. Mm -hmm. Because you've got to be the one that wants to change your money situation. There's nobody else that's going to do it for you. You have to be the one that wants to change it. So what's been the toughest part? What still is the toughest part for you that you have to always be working on? Uh, I guess creation from money. Now, I know that sounds weird, but it's because one of the things that I realized, Jeremy, was I felt comfortable in debt. So there's been a few times like, you, you know, I in, in my book, I talk about this story that it's like, you know, I'm sitting in my office and I'm paying my accounts, I'm on my computer and I look at everything and I look down and I realize that I actually have money. It's like my credit cards are paid off, my bills are paid, I've got money in the bank and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm not in debt. And I was on my own, I was in my office and I'm looking out the window and I sort of thought, this is it, this is a bit boring, like, you know, <laughs> where's the marching band, where's the, you know, the fireworks sort of thing. And to me it wasn't that exciting, it wasn't that thrilling. But I was like, okay, I'm out of debt. Great, you know. And in two weeks' time, I noticed that I was back in debt. Hmm. And I went, oh, grateful for the access tools, like asking questions because I was like, oh, what do I love about being in debt, which is a great question to ask. And what I realized I loved about being in debt was I was more comfortable. I was more comfortable creating. Like it was like, oh, I need money, I'm in debt, so I must create this. Like, you know, that glitter story. Like that's why I went and sold all this glitter in Sydney, in, you know, in the main street of Sydney because I needed money. Rather than if I had money, what would I create? So I'd say that's sort of still the toughest thing to do because it's like I think most people have this energy about like, oh, if I had all this money, then I'd probably sit around and do nothing. And it's like, is that really true? Like one of the tools I always give out um, – uh, Dr. Dane here said this and I thought it was wonderful, is every January, if you have a million dollars in the bank, what would you choose? Would you still be choosing what you're currently creating? Because mm -hmm. it's, like, it's got to be fun for you. Right. So if it's like if it wasn't about money, what would you create? So I'd say that that's still um, a slight struggle for me is like um, not creating, making sure I'm not creating debt to actually create. So... So what's some of your favorite questions to ask yourself um, on a daily basis? Okay. So yesterday I had um, not the best day in the world, I would say. <laughs> it was one of those days that one I felt like every corner I turned, I was like, seriously, like all these things going on. But I was really grateful for the tools. I mean, I had people like quitting uh, certain jobs on me, projects that were due sort of now and all this sort of thing. And the first thing, you know, 30 seconds, I'm like, ah, you know, and then I was like, okay, one of my favorite questions, what's right about this I'm not getting? Because you know what, it's just change. So it's like, okay, what's right about this I'm not getting? Because the first thing you go to is like, say someone quit, you know, creating something for me and I was like, damn, it's almost Christmas. It's like finding someone to do that now. I mean, I, I don't know about in Chicago, but in Australia, it's damn hot here and everything stops. Like people... Just don't do anything. There's Most businesses go on holidays from about the 20th of December to 15th, 19th of January. Mm. It's like the beaches are packed and it's like, you know, it stops. So finding someone to do something, you're like, ugh. So I went, okay, so who could I add to this who would actually um, create this as a greater product, as a greater possibility? And then I, someone just came into my head straight away and I text her and she texted me back and she said, you're so funny. She said, I was driving home today thinking, how can I add more joy to my life? Like that was a question she was asking. And then I text her saying, hey, you, can you help me with joy of business with, you know, this thing, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, I didn't think it was going to come in the form of business, but hey, there it is. So the questions would be, what's right about this I'm not getting? Fantastic. 
Um, because so many times if something doesn't work out, especially in business, your life, you know, it's like you think you go to the wrongness and you start to judge you. What if you didn't judge you and you asked the question, what's right about this I'm not getting? Um, what else is possible? How does it get any better than this? Which are all access consciousness questions. Mm-hmm. Is I ask them every day. It's like even when you're paying bills, it's like, you know, every time you pay a bill, ask, how does it get any better than this? Because it's like most people pay their bills and go to that place of, you know, when you slip out of being present because it's like, oh, you're paying the phone bill. And it's like, I mean, seriously, at the beginning I used to sit there and go, okay, I'm paying my phone bill, you know, on my own in my office going, so grateful for you, phone bill. How does it get any better than this? Like this is me on my, I'm not telling anyone that I'm using these tools. I'm just going to try them out and see what happens. So I'd sit there with every bill. And I'd even at one stage used to write on there, how does it get any better than this? And I'd pay the bill, you know. So, but what I got was it's this energy and an energy of question, energy of demand, um, an energy of more choice showing up. So, so they'd be my three favorite questions. Yeah, I like that. Thanks for sharing that. So what are some of the favorite, your favorite questions in the joy of business in the book? Well, uh, Look, I've got one here. All right. <laughs> I want to hear one of your favorite stories from the book, and I want to hear about some of the good questions in the book. Okay. Yeah. So I would say one of my favorite stories, which I talk about, because, I mean, a lot of the stories in the book are from my life of doing business. And then I sort of came across Access Consciousness and went, oh, this is, this is what I knew, you know, is the way to do business. But no one ever sort of spoke about that or did it that way. So... I used to do business in India a lot, in India, Nepal, Thailand, Tibet. Uh, I was importing and I was, you know, selling at markets in Australia. I used to do really well. I mean, well, at that stage I was making like, you know, $3,000, $4,000 on a weekend selling at the markets in Hmm. Sydney. What kind of stuff were you importing? Um... Anything from like semi-precious stone, silver jewelry, you know, I'd have the Tibetan prayer flags. I had a hat business that I had and we had... um, like in winter, we had all the uh, the woolen hats with the surf design sort of thing and then the cotton hats. And I used to work with um, Nepalese farming village women on, on making the woolen hats um, uh, and Tibetan refugee women working on the other on the other designs. So I, I lo- loved going to Nepal. It was great. I mean, that's the thing. It's like it was fun to do business there. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, but one of the things that I used to do, and I, I still do, I just, I guess, call it something different, is in India. Have you ever been to India, Jeremy? No, I haven't. It's it's one of the strangest countries in the world. Like, you just have to go there with absolutely no point of view and go, this is India. Everything that shows up. Like, there's no there's no logic. There's no time thing. It's it's really interesting country to go to. It's a country you sort of end up loving to hate and, and, and hate to love sort of thing. Um but there's this one street in Delhi that I used to go to and I w- literally walked the streets looking for suppliers because there's shops that have – because I did bedspreads. Um, I did clothing. I ended up designing clothing. You're a serious clothing. hustler. Somewhere. Yeah. You hustle. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you know what? I've never, I don't think I've ever looked at it as hustling though. Yeah, yeah. Which is funny because so many people have a judgment on sales and I'm always like – I mean you see people – I mean that in a positive – positive way by the way thank you yes, thank yes. you no i can pretty much not I've like you're been... hustling someone but you are hustling. no i know, yeah, yes. I know. Yeah. well i used to um but you know the funny thing is jeremy my mother took me to the doctors when i was a kid because she thought something was wrong with me because i never spoke she said you, your eyes were this big and you just used to walk in the room and stare and i wouldn't speak until i was about five so really? people can hardly believe that why yeah. do you think why do you think you didn't speak till you're five Okay, so this is my uh, awareness. Yeah. I think I was, I mean, I think I was shocked to be back here on this planet, just going seriously and back. <laughs> I didn't think I had to come back. So, and then I guess I just sort of went, okay, let's do this. And when I was five, I just started talking. So, which people find that very hard to believe. <laughs> Me and my partner's always like, you know, I go, what if I've got nothing to say? And he's like, honey, I don't think that's ever going to happen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, but when I was in India and I used to walk the streets and I, I you know, because you'd have these streets, it's crazy, and they'd sell the same thing in every street, right? So you'd have a street with 40 shops and they all sold bedspreads, which I was like, why wouldn't you put 
sell furniture in there or something like that, you know, something, another business that's going to create something different. But they all sold bedspreads. They still do it like that. So I would walk down the street and I'd talk to them, but I used to call it the vibe. Like I was like, I wanted to do business with someone who created, you know, a vibe that I wanted to do it with. Because a lot of people in India doing business too was always like, well, how much money will you give me today? Not mm. what can we create now and in the future? So mm. I was always trying to create this, look, we can have a future relationship here. What could that look like? Um, so I talk a lot about the stories of doing business in India, which is, I mean, you know, it was quite hilarious. At one stage, I was a vegetarian for eight years and when I was in Nepal, um, to honor me, they slaughtered a goat <laughs> and mm. the Muslims slaughtered a goat. So they had it hanging up and, I mean, they do it all, you know, very well. It's ritualistic, you know, slaughter the goat and um, pour the blood out and then they cut the, the goat up and they gave me this bowl of warm milk and goat's fat and I'm a vegetarian with it in front of me and I was thinking I knew I had to have some of it because I was like if I don't it was such a dishonoring of them mm. like it was the special time of year. Yeah. no so I was just like oh I mean warm milk to start with is not my favorite thing and then there's goat's fat in it doesn't sound <laughs> doesn't seriously? sound tasty to me no no so so I did I, I drank it down and my friend who knew that I was a vegetarian and it was just she was sitting there just cracking up because I was the main center of attention you know I mean they're really grateful to do business with you as well so there's a lot of things like that that I had to sort of go, you have to get over your own point of view and think that everybody does it like you do, you know. I mean, my niece was here the other day and I don't know if you've heard, but in Australia we had this terrorist attack the yeah. other day. Yeah, I did read that. Yeah. So we had it on the news and it was pretty full on. I mean, Australians think they're, you know, we've got koalas and kangaroos and we think we're safe from everything. Like we don't feel threatened. Right. So in some way, it was pretty amazing what got created. And I don't know if you saw in the news, there was um, – we had this whole hashtag thing of like, I'll ride with you. And everyone, everyone, it was huge. Everyone was hashtagging, Twittering, Facebooking, saying, I'll ride with you. I'm going to be on this train. I'll be wearing this or contact me here. So that everyone who was from, you know, I mean, we're pretty multicultural here, from a different religion or Muslim or wore any sort of religion, religious sort of garb. Um, knew that they were safe to travel. And it was like I cried when I was reading this whole thread. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. But my niece, who's much, you know, she's much younger. She's like nine or something. She goes, Honey Simone, what's a terrorist? And I was like, oh, good question. And I'm like, <laughs> how do I answer that, you know? But I looked at it and was like, well, it's one it's one sort of person or religion wanting um Wanting the other person, like we disagree with the way we live basically is, and we disagree with the choices that the other one is making. So then this person is trying to impel that point of view on, on these bunch of people. It's like everyone's fighting for the rightness of their point of view and it's like what if that didn't exist? Like what if we were in allowance of, of everyone's religion, of the way everyone was, whether you had a religion or didn't have a religion, you know. So same thing with money. It's like you're in allowance of it. It's like, I mean, one of the biggest judgments in the world is money, the lack of money or having money. Yeah. It's like what if that didn't exist? So, so how do you get over that judgment of money for yourself or other people? Well, Jeremy, I think that's a choice. Like I think what a lot of this comes down to is what do you want to choose and what's working for you. Like, like you know when you asked me like when my walls were sort of caving in and I felt stuck, that didn't work for me. I was like, okay, I don't like this sense of the walls caving in and, I, and feeling stuck. So what do I have to do to change it, which is a question. So I get that it is a choice to um, choose something different. Like a while ago I had a friend of mine, I was – so surprised, she said, oh, I don't hang out with those people anymore because they make too much money. <laughs> I was like, seriously? Mm. I've never done that. I've never, you know, created a friendship or relationship based on the amount of money someone has or the lack of money that they have. It's sort of mm. just been like, hi, you know, my name's Simone, whatever. I've dealt with very wealthy people and I've dealt with extreme poverty and it's it's interesting to see that that is what occurs in the world. And for me, working with Access Consciousness, Jeremy, is is the key to um, 
having those tools available around the world to create a difference. That's what it should be. Yeah. So what else, um, to tell people to check out Joy of Business, what else is really important in that book that people should look out for? Um, probably what some people call the nut, um, the boring part, the nuts and bolts. Because, <laughs> you know, uh, I talk, I mean, I tell a lot of stories and with the stories I give questions um, and there's some processes in there as well to run, to sort of get you over your stuck points of view. Mm-hmm. And then I do have a lot of what I call the nuts and bolts. Like there was, and I learned this from, I mean, my dad, he was an accountant as well, my dad, and years and years ago, he had so much patience dealing with me because all I wanted to do was create, you know, create, 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 and uh, it wasn't about the nuts and bolts or the financial stuff. And I remember this dad, my dad drew me, um, drew me a graph one day and he was like, you know, this is your financial awareness sort of thing and this is the create side and, you know, and I was like, that's not the graph that I want to do. I want to do this. And mine was huge, you know, 90% create sort of thing and 10% of, you know, dealing with the financial stuff. And he looked at me and he was always so patient and he was like, oh, Simone. And he said, if you don't have this and pointed to the financial information, you won't have this, which was all the create part. And I knew he was correct. And so I started to look at that. So, yeah. you know, there's some really pragmatic tools in, in my book. Yeah, what's one of the tools that's often overlooked for people or they just dismiss it because it feels boring to them, but it's essential? A profit and loss statement. Know how to read one. It's like you don't have to do it. You don't have to do the bookkeeping. You don't have to do any of that. And it's funny because people judge if they don't know how to read a profit and loss statement. But I say go, um, you know, have a meeting with your bookkeeper or your accountant and ask them, okay, can you please just, you know, show me all of this? And most accountants also will sort of say, well, how can you cut down your, you know, expenses? That's not my question. I'm like, what else can you create? Okay, you've got your expenses. Now, what else do you need to create to, you know, outweigh the expenses so that you're actually making a profit? But learn how to read that. And even if you don't hear it the way they say it, say, hey, can you get a whiteboard out? Can you describe some things to me? And one of the things I highly recommend is have at least two financial awareness meetings or financial planning meetings a year. Like the end of our financial year is June. I think in the US it's it's December. Like so your new financial year starts in January. So halfway through the year, have a financial planning meeting and then just before it so that you know what you can start to create. You can make a huge difference if you're aware of stuff. Like even from, okay, so... Looks like I've made a lot more money this year, so what do I need to do? Maybe I can book some more tickets for my traveling before the end of the financial year because that's a tax deduction. You know, there's just things to start looking at like that. I mean, I now find that a lot of fun because it's like I call it creative accounting. So I'd say the creative accounting in the book is is probably the thing that thrills me the most and can actually make you successful. (laughs) Yeah, I like that. So what... um has been the lowest point, lowest moment, and then what's been the proudest so far? Uh, Lowest point, um, so it's it's sort of difficult to find one in a way because I I have learned not to judge my life as it was. I mean, I did a lot of dodgy things in my life. I lived a pretty colorful life, you know. I did a lot of drugs at one stage and – and I knew I was just trying to find something different. Um, yeah, what drew so, you to what drew you to the drugs? Um, the difference, because I couldn't. I I I was walking around just going, "This can't be it. This can't be it." <laughs> it's like you know, this lifestyle, this everything, like the rules, the regulations, that this this can't be it. There has to be something else. And so when I took drugs, it sort of gave me that. No barrier. Perspective, yeah. yeah, different perspective, yeah. Um, the first class I ever went to with Access, I stopped taking drugs too because I went, I was literally sitting there going, I mean, Gary spoke to me in, in a break and he was talking about drugs at one stage in the class and I started crying and he came over and he said, are you okay? And I said, well, you got me on the drug thing. And he went, I know. And he said, look, he said, if you're taking drugs and choosing consciousness, it's like sitting on the edge of a fence. And he said, one day you'll end up impaled. I was like, yeah, okay, good point. And, you know, I I actually stopped taking drugs that weekend because I was like, this is actually what I was looking for. 
by taking drugs. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was really grateful for that. So I could say that's a low point and, and also, Jeremy, I'm really grateful that I've done all of that because I have no place to judge anyone either. Right. It's like I didn't, you know, I didn't, you know, walk this life of, you know, the golden girl. <laughs> it's like, you know, I, I did some, uh, you know, what we call dodgy in Australia, dodgy things. So it's like I don't have that place to judge. It's like uh, so it's low point and I'm grateful as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you asked about the the high point. Yeah. i got to say like working with Access Consciousness has been such a thrill for me to because it matches the energy of what I'd like to create in the world and what I'd like everybody to know about, like what we were talking about, what if the world was filled with kindness and not this, you know, antagonism. And um, recently I had a class in Europe and it was translated into seven different languages, which Mm. was really cool. That's pretty cool, yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm actually really popular in Europe and the countries like Hungary and Croatia and uh, Poland and Slovenia and Turkey and and it's awesome because for me, realizing that language is also not a barrier. It's like that I have this possibility of of, um, of reaching everyone with tools that can change any area of their life that they right. think is not working for them is um, is a real thrill for me and continues to expand. Yeah. So. Yeah. so- so well, I appreciate you sharing all of this because it's, you know, you really have to open up and get personal and I think it'll be valuable for people to hear. Where should people check you out? Tell people where they should check you out and what are you working on currently? Um, you can check me out on accessjoyofbusiness.com. Uh, on Facebook, we've got, um, I'm so bad at that. I have a social media team that... Um, <laughs> That looks sort of that, but it's um, on Facebook. It's Joy of Business Facebook. Um, I think it's on your site too, Access Joy of Business. There's a Facebook yeah, tab, Facebook. a Twitter tab. They all, can't they? And what I'm working on at the moment is a new book, and it's called From Debt to Money Play. Well, I think I might change the name. I'm not sure. But the whole idea is, and because I see that so many people are sort of grateful that I was in debt because they're not like, oh, you're, you've got money, you're wealthy, you've got, you know, mm-hmm your jewels and whatever and and you always had that. I didn't always have that. Right. So it's pretty much about being in debt. So it's pretty vulnerable too and and then getting out of it and actually starting to play with money, not making money so significant. So so at the moment it's called From Debt to Money Play and I might change that name. So mm. if you have any good ideas, let me know, Jeremy. I'll think about <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Simone, it's been an absolute pleasure. Any parting words that uh, you'd like to leave the audience? Uh, Trust what you know. Gary Douglas told me that as soon as I met him and that was one thing that I sort of went, oh, thank God. It's like someone wasn't telling me the the answer. It's like he said, trust you. Trust what you know. It's like because nobody knows what you know. So trust that and follow that in every area of your life. Fantastic. Relationships, business, money, everything. Simone, thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Next time they come to the U.S., please look me up. I will. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks. Bye.